Right, welcome. We have Philip Metaluna with us in Second Life, alias Phil Farber in Real Life, who works with magic. He's written many books on uh, meta magic, and he's just created a new book called The Way of Woohoo! <laughs> so we're going to be learning about. <laughs> <laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> we're going to be learning about Phil's work and uh, so I'm going to be asking him some very exciting questions that I've been dying to ask him and so welcome Phil and thank you very much for coming along to my cottage in the sky um, so the first question I would like to ask you is how did you become the expert you are today uh, in on magic what what, is your, what has your journey been and how has it brought you to where you are today? Well, I guess uh, how do you become an expert in magic is pretty much uh, how you become an expert in anything else. It's practice and study. Um, I've been involved in this uh, for, you know, 25 years, something like that. And um, uh, I started out with very traditional forms of magic. Actually, I was practicing magic... Um, around the same time I started getting into NLP. So the two of them kind of meshed in my mind uh, around the same time. And the NLP um, obviously became very useful in modeling the magic and gave me, um, I guess, a different level of understanding it. And, um, oh, I don't know. I really, uh, my interest in magic came... Um, I don't know, ever since I was a child, I was always interested in the paranormal and ESP and things like that. And when I was in college, I started coming across uh, books on magic, actually. A, a friend uh, left a, uh, a book by Aleister Crowley uh, in my apartment uh, accidentally, and uh, it looked weird and fun, and I, I picked it up and read it. And uh, uh, much to my surprise, it wasn't the kind of... Um, uh, flaky, dark stuff that I had been led to believe it would be, but was rather uh, kind of a uh, light-infused, uh, very powerful way of uh, changing your, your brain and your neurology. So uh, I continued to pursue that and study it, and uh, uh, that's pretty much it over 20-something uh, years. Wow, so you've just been kind of obsessed with magic and learning everything about it and and uh, you've just got really engrossed in it and decided to write your books and uh, so, every, you know, people kind of see you as an expert in this field now, which is uh, why I asked that question because it's always interesting to know why people, um, you know, got where they were. Um, so... You know, I did your workshop in London, so I was very fortunate to be able to experience your work in real life. Um, and one of the questions I wanted to ask is, we worked a lot with entities, and I, I wondered um, if you could explain to people, because it's quite a scary word to a lot of people, um, if, you could, if you could sort of explain what entities means and your definition of it. The, uh, the term entity means something that... Uh display some measure of uh, intelligence or consciousness or sentience. And basically the, the prototype of an entity is another human. Okay? I mean, we look at each other and hopefully some part of our mind recognizes uh, that we are other intelligent beings and so on. And um, uh, when we apply that same neurology to other things in the world, to concepts, uh, ideas, schools of thought, um, uh, and so on, uh, and we're able to perceive them as in some way being self-directed or conscious, uh, then that's really what we would call an entity. It's, it's something based in our neurology that tells us that something is alive and sentient and able to communicate. A lot of your work is around magic with a K, and... So, so could you kind of clear up for us why this whole sort of magic with a K, what it means, and because I know you mentioned it in the course in London. Um, so why, why magic with a K? That's what I'd like to know. Well, the magic with a K is really the archaic form. Uh, I mean, the way it was spelled in the Middle Ages or earlier. 
And uh, that was kind of revived to give it the sense of uh, that it's a spiritual discipline, that it's something that we do to change our consciousness rather than uh, stage illusion, okay? Um, there's more technical Kabbalistic meanings because um, when we get into studying words and magic, every letter has a value and, and so on. So that when we spell things in certain ways, um, it's important for them to add up properly and match with other words that have similar values and, and so on. So there is a whole rationale uh, behind the spelling that way. Um, uh, another way is um, that the K um, represents um, in, in Greek uh, katis, which is the uh, female element, uh, to show that it's not just uh, a one-sided uh, male thing and it's just will and so on, but it's will and understanding and so on. That there's, there's two sides to the equation. Uh, and um, one way we have of saying that is that um, the great work, which is the goal of magic, uh, is the union of opposites. So we always find these uh, male-female dyadic parents. I'm just wondering how much of a process do you think magic is in terms of using rituals and how different it is from NLP and its processes? Can you kind of give us a, uh, a picture on how magic actually works in terms of rituals and process? Um, I do make the, the distinction uh, generally with magic. All right, the, the broadest definition of magic uh, was Aleister Crowley's who said magic is the art and science of causing change in conformity with will. Um, by that definition, I would think that NLP would be a subset of magic, so would science. Um, however, uh, I like to, to make the subtle distinction that uh, magic is the art and science of using ritual to create, cause change in conformity with will. So. Um, the ritual um, kind of gives a frame or a structure to our, our behaviors, and we use rituals all day long. Um, we have a ritual for eating breakfast, a ritual for eating lunch, and it, it's a basic human behavior. And when we start to package our other behaviors into these, these kinds of frames, and of course they can be more powerful and more intriguing frames than eating breakfast, uh, but... Uh, when we start to package other behaviors into these frames, we, we can get very strong responses, and our consciousness responds more easily somehow. Right. I, I'd like to verify that, because uh, do you remember when I told you, uh, when we were creating our own entity, I had an eagle head, and I saw the eye, and I was swooping down on Canary Wharf. Um, well, actually, when I got home that week, I saw the exact vision that I saw through my entity's eyes in that I was able to see the uh, the magnified view of the rich pickings and also this peregrine hawk was swooping down over Canary Wharf, aka a Google Earth perspective. So that was just really weird and spooky. That, that was so powerful for me. Well, that's fun. I mean, we... we find that a lot. Uh, people do things in rituals where they they see things in their future or in places where they uh, they can't physically see and so on. Um, we've done experiments where we've had people um, do, do ritual work um, in our studio here in New York or uh, in New York City when we were doing this and, and then have people go outside and look around and confirm the things that they became aware of while they were inside and doing the ritual and it's often extremely accurate. So, so how much does this re resemble something like remote viewing? Well, I, I think we can use magic techniques to develop things that are very much like remote viewing. Um, I have some techniques in uh, the Metamagic book that um, are pretty much like remote viewing. I, I, we sort of approach it from a different way, but the upshot is that you could actually put your consciousness somewhere distant and uh, uh, find out what's going on there.